Thank you, Steve. And let me echo the other speakers in thanking the organizers for putting together uh, this wonderful workshop. Really had a lot of fun. Um, and let me also thank, most importantly, uh, my wonderful collaborator, uh, Zara, who's uh, uh, at McGill and moving to CERN next year, uh, who is really uh, invaluable and, and taught me a lot of things uh, that were uh, useful in these two papers that came out last year. Um, and the subject of these papers will be talking about physics that is really very simple. And, uh, and that's kind of part of the point here is going to be exploring a limit of physics in ADS, really motivated by trying to understand things in the ADS CFT duality, but a limit that we can understand basically with an undergraduate quantum mechanics. Uh, would be sufficient level to, to understand what's going on. And the advantage of that is that we have a huge amount of control of what's going on. We know a lot of things in detail, non-perturbatively, of what can happen. And we can bring to bear all the tools that we learned in our quantum mechanics class. And really, a lot of the problems we're interested in ADS CFT have analogs in this very simple context. So I think this is an extra kind of limit to have in your toolbox and have in mind when you're studying some problem that you're interested in uh, and, and see if it has a version uh, in this limit that's, that's a little bit uh, more tractable. And there we go. Okay, so let's just outline to begin with the main idea. Um, we're going to be taking a, a non-relativistic limit of physics in anti dissipate space. Uh, so, okay, here's your metric, the global metric of, of ADS space. Um, and what we're going to do is take C to infinity, but importantly, we're going to keep some piece of the curvature of ADS spacetime when we do that. So we'll remember that, uh, that the Newtonian limit of general relativity, the important thing uh, that gives us a Newtonian gravitational potential is GTT. In particular, GTT is one plus a Newtonian potential. And if we look at this for, for ADS, the Newtonian potential is just a, a quadratic, so it's a harmonic potential. Uh, and the coefficient of the harmonic potential that appears, the, the frequency of this harmonic potential is uh, the speed of light divided by the ADS length. So what we're going to be doing is taking the speed of light to infinity, taking the ADS length to infinity, but keeping this ADS frequency or ADS time fixed. Um, and, uh, and that means that every particle we have, so maybe we've got some particle of mass m, uh, is going to be interacting with other particles and so forth, but it's also going to have this sort of Newtonian cosmological potential that always wants to bring it back to the middle of ADS. And uh, for this thing to be non-relativistic, we need to live in some particular regime of parameters. So there's a few ways of thinking about this. So one is to say that the rest energy of our particle, mc squared, should be bigger than the typical uh, the, the energy you can build uh, non-relativistically, which is h bar omega, which is the quantum of the harmonic oscillator. So that's one way of saying the regime of parameters. Another way of saying the regime of parameters is that there's a length scale you can build non-relativistically, which is the width of the harmonic oscillator wave function with frequency omega. And that width of the harmonic oscillator wave function should be much smaller than the ADS curvature scale, which means that our particle can sit in the middle of ADS. It has its wave function, but it's not seeing the spatial curvature. So what we're doing is we're keeping this potential, but we're not going to be seeing the spatial curvature, only this uh, sort of space-time curvature coming from GTT. Uh, so we can see what this looks like in, uh, in, in CFT language. Uh, so in CFT, the mass of a particle is related to its conformal dimension, basically linearly. Uh, so the dimension is just the mass in ADS units. And all this says is that the, the Conformal dimension has to be much bigger than one. Uh, you can actually be a little bit more careful here uh, and say that the conformal dimension, there's a mass that comes from the rest energy, and there's a d over 2. That d over 2 is just the zero point energy of d harmonic oscillators. d is, corresponds to the number of transverse dimensions. And that is the same thing you get when you expand this famous formula that we all learn in our first class of ADS CFT. Uh, there's a d over 2 shift that has this very, very simple explanation that you get from undergraduate physics. So anyway, what we're going to be doing then is studying objects of large conformal dimension, which is something that has been done a little bit before, but as we'll see, 
it's not just large conformal dimension, it's also a kinematic regime that means our particles can't move too fast. Okay, and, uh, okay. So this is going to be the, the basic idea. Uh, and, okay, so let's just give a few motivating words about why we want to study such a thing, if I can change my slides. No? Hey, here we go. Good, okay. So my main motivation for this comes, as I said, from uh, ADS-CFT, various problems we might be interested in. Um, for example, understanding how dynamical space-time emerges from CFT degrees of freedom. Um, so there's a very toy version of a dynamical space-time, and that's like dynamical Newtonian potentials. Like you have two particles, they interact with a one over R, you know, inverse square law and so forth. That really is a toy version, at least, of moving your space-time away from pure ADS to, to something else. And if we can understand how to build up a Newtonian potential from CFT variables, that's a toy version of this idea of, of where a dynamical metric comes from. But really, we've got now a tractable regime of bulk physics where we really know what's going on non-perturbatively. There's various solvable examples. You can, you know, numerically, you can solve ODEs to find the spectrum of the Hamiltonian, all these kind of things we love. And also, it's pedagogically very useful. I think ADS, maybe when we first meet it, is a slightly confusing place. And, and to have a very down-to-earth way of thinking about it, I think, is useful. Okay, and there are a few things we'll mention. Uh, for example, uh, taking a flat space-time limit. Again, we have a huge amount of control in this non-relativistic regime, so we can say things about this flat space-time limit that, uh, that we can then sort of extend to, uh, to the, the full problem that we're really interested in. Okay, so to begin with, I'll um, uh, explain how to understand this limit from a point of view just of the symmetries. So let's say all you know is that you've got a CFT and it has this SOD, 2 symmetry. And all we're going to do, so here's your SOD, 2 symmetry. It has this algebra with some rotations. So there's the dilatation operator D, momentum, spectral and formal generators. And it has these hermeticity relations. And all we're going to do is suppose we're living in some sector of that, of our CFT, where this dilatation operator, which is the, uh, this is the, the Hamiltonian, generates the Hamiltonian on, uh, on SD, SD minus one times S, yeah, the Hamiltonian on SD minus one. Uh, we'll say that this is some constant, MC squared, plus some other piece. And what we're going to say is this constant is going to be large compared to this other piece. So all that means is that in this second set of relations, the, the important leading piece we're going to keep is just this constant. So we're just going to keep this constant m, which we can think of as a central element of the algebra, um, or it's really just a constant. Okay. So this is what our algebra reduces to. And this is actually, of course, something extremely familiar. So, okay, this tells you that the momentum operator raises the energy, the special conformal operator lowers the energy, but now the, the commutator of these two things is a constant. And a raising operator whose conjugate is a lowering operator, and the, uh, and the commutator is a, um, uh, the commutator is a constant is something very familiar. So Macbeth recognizes it. Is this a dagger which I see before me, he says, when he sees the momentum operator? And that's right. If you just rescale these generators, then this is really the harmonic oscillator algebra. So the momentum operator becomes the creation operator, a dagger. And the special conformal operator becomes the, uh, becomes the annihilation operator, a. Okay, so this is this very abstract way that we see this harmonic potential coming out, just through the symmetries. Um, and... Um, once we know this algebra, we know that we can write this dilatation operator as this central piece, and then uh, there's, we know that we're able to write the, the harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian in this A dagger A form, um, and then finally there's this other piece H. So this is just an abstract way of rewriting the, um, the non-relativistic Hamiltonian in such a way that this extra piece H actually commutes with the momentum operator and the special conformal operator. So 
what we've done really here is we've separated out the kinematic piece that's kind of boring and determined by symmetries, and we've got the dynamical interesting piece left over. Uh, and that has a very simple interpretation that we, we're familiar with, is we've separated out the center of mass motion from the relative motion. And so the Hilbert space actually splits the center of mass tensor with the relative motion, and primaries in particular are the things that are annihilated by the special conformal generator, which is the annihilation operator. So the states that are annihilated by A, that's precisely the ground state of our harmonic oscillator. So the primaries correspond to putting the center of mass wave function in the ground state and letting something interesting go on in the relative motion, and descendants just come from moving the center of mass in some interesting way. Okay, so a little bit more concretely, the example we're going to study explicitly is just two particles that interact via some central potential. So you write the subkinetic piece, a gravitational potential that's from this Newtonian uh, ADS potential, and some interaction. And there's the usual change of variables where you go to center of mass and relative motion. And the center of mass piece is this piece up here, uh, which is boring. It's just totally determined by kinematics. And the interesting piece is the is this leftover piece. And we'll remember from our uh, uh, undergraduate mechanics classes, the, the relevant thing that appears is this reduced mass, the harmonic mean of the two particle masses. And these, these two things decouple with each other. OK, so to kind of summarize all of this, what we've really done is taken the, the uh, conformal SOD, 2 algebra that governs dynamics in ADS, and we've done a, a reduction, a known ubiquitous um, reduction of that algebra, and uh, and arrived at this thing, which is which is new and no one's really studied, uh, as far as I know. Um, so that's it's a familiar reduction you can do of the ADS algebra is to take just the ADS length to infinity, which reduces to the Poincaré algebra, and then you can take the Poincaré algebra and take c to infinity and get a Galilean algebra back. We're sort of doing that in the opposite order. So what we're doing is filling in this bottom left corner of the diagram and talking about also a little about this limit, which is returns to the flat space. OK, so it's a very natural thing. And in particular, the thing to emphasize is that you might have thought that adding this harmonic potential would break the translation symmetries you get in the Galilean invariant system. Um, but it doesn't actually break them. Rather, it deforms them. Uh, so the Galilean symmetry algebra gets deformed to the harmonic oscillator algebra. Um, so, uh, let's talk a little about now the, um, what, we, what we can study in, this, in this, this class of theories in this limit. Uh, so from the CFT, there's a few different things we might be interested in. Uh, the first is correlation functions. So we have some operators O1 and O2 that are dual to some particles. And we'll, uh, what I'll argue in a moment is that correlation functions in this limit become essentially matrix elements of coherent states. And the relevant regime is not just large dimensions, like we said at the beginning, but also the kinematic scale in a way that, so the cross ratios go like one over the dimensions. We'll explain why we get these coherent states in a moment. The other thing we may be interested in as well are the, the conformal data that underlie this. So that's the spectrum of the theory and its OP coefficients. So we can ask about decomposing these correlation functions in the in the S channel. So it's got a some conformal block decomposition. And the operators that appear here are the things in the CFT we would call double traces, which are these uh, kind of composite operators. And these are just two particle uh, states in ADS. And the spectrum of these operators is just given by the spectrum of this non-relativistic Hamiltonian. And it turns out that the OPE coefficients also have that appear in this decomposition also have a very simple explanation, which is you diagonalize your Hamiltonian, there's some wave functions, eigenfunctions, and you just read off how quickly those eigenfunctions decay. There's some constant that tells you what the tail looks like, and that immediately tells you the OPE coefficients. So you can understand these OP, sort of not very intuitive OPE coefficients in a, in a very sort of down-to-earth way. And the other thing you might be interested in is the T-channel data. This is much more complicated, and it's harder to understand from the non-relativistic point of view. And it's really maybe where a lot of the interest comes in. Um, so there's, there's some operators here that are the, really the things that you exchange to mediate some potential. Uh, 
Okay, so let's talk briefly about this um, correlation function then uh, and why we get these coherent states. So um, a correlation function we get by, um, by uh, you know, inserting some operators on the boundary and uh, first of all, inserting an operator at the, say, so okay, this is a picture of the uh, Euclidean global ADS. If we insert an operator down in the distant past, that's a primary state, which, you've, uh, which we've already argued is a state where the wave function is in the ground state of the harmonic oscillator. So this operator O corresponds to a, uh, this, the Gaussian wave function of the ground state. Now, if we wanted to insert the operator at some other location, all we have to do is act by the exponential of the momentum generator. But what does the momentum generator become? Well, we already said it becomes a dagger, it becomes a creation operator. So in the non-relativistic limit, this moving of the operator corresponds to, act, uh, to making this coherent state wave function. So that applies for a single operator insertion, and we can play this game with two operators. The only challenge here is that these two particles now can interact, but you can play a game that I won't explain here for time, but is very similar to what we do defining scattering states. Asymptotically, when these things are far apart, it's just like a Fox space, it's like two coherent states, and you can create an interacting version of coherent states. So, okay, we end up with these, um, that, that's how we, by inserting two operators, we end up with something like a coherent state wave function. And then our correlators are just given by matrix elements of these things. So with these kinds of ideas, we end up with a very natural set of observables in this context of quantum mechanics living in a, in a, uh, in a quadratic potential. Um, in particular, if you've got a matrix element of this form, something you could do is compute it by inserting a complete set of intermediate states. And of course, once we do that, we get nothing but the S-channel conformal block decomposition and by examining this, this is where you get this formula for the OPU coefficient that's given on the last slide. Um, so that was a little bit quick, but um, I hope it's given a flavor of, uh, of what the kind of observables and, and how you kind of solve these, these sorts of theories. I'm just going to very quickly flash a couple of um, applications that are interesting, but but I don't have time to talk about in any detail, but I'd be happy to, uh, if people want to speak about it later. One of them is a flat space time limit, which is very straightforward to uh, talk about in this context. So one is that scattering states in a theory in flat space time, once you add the harmonic potential, they really become discrete bound states with certain gaps, and you can very, very easily uh, see there's a formula that the anomalous dimensions of these states in ADS are given precisely by scattering phase shifts. And this is a formula that, that uh, versions of this have appeared first order in perturbation theory and things like this. Um, uh, but this is really an exact non-perturbative formula, anomalous dimension equals phase shift, um, that you can show with extremely simple uh, you know, un undergraduate quantum mechanics. Again, um, it's similar to a formula that appeared in this S-matrix bootstrap paper. Um, and this I really expect to not just be non-relativistic, but true at least for elastic scattering um, more generally. Uh, though this more sophisticated formula is important if there's an elastic effect. Uh, there's also a correlation function here, which I won't talk about, but again, like here, anomalous dimension equals phase shift, very simple relation. Here there's CFT four-point function, equal scattering amplitude. Uh, again, an extremely simple um, relationship between flat space-time data and, and CFT correlation functions uh, in this limit, and it's similar to things that appeared in, this, um, in these papers outside this um, uh, non-relativistic regime. Okay. Uh, another cute thing is a non-perturbative thing is, is resonances. And you can see how, uh, how resonances appear in the spectrum of the CFT by very uh, characteristic reconnections of Reggie trajectories. It's a very nice um, picture of, of how sort of metastable states in flat space time get stabilized by the ADS potential and what the, um, what the spectrum looks like. But the reason I skipped through that so fast is that I wanted to talk for the last few minutes a little about, about the T channel, because this is 
think where things are a little bit harder, um, but we'd like to make more progress. So this is the correlation function we were interested in. And um, a, a couple of tools we'll be interested in is first of all, expanding this in the T channel, understanding what are the operators that, that mediate interactions in a systematic way. And then also we can, uh, another tool we're going to use is um, Simone's Lorentzian inversion formula and understand how that works in this, in this simpler context. And this was really my excuse to learn about the Lorentzian inversion formula and have Zara teach me all about it, uh, was to study it in this limit. Um, and just wanted to give uh, okay, a few words on that. Um, okay, so this T-channel block decomposition, okay, you're, you write your correlation function as a sum of, of, of these terms labeled by the operators T that, that mediate some interaction. So say a gravitational interaction, this T will be a stress tensor. But you'll also have double trace operators and, and more complicated things. Um, so these kinematic objects here are the conformal blocks. And in the non-relativistic limit, these have an extremely simple expression. The easiest way to get there is by using this integral representation of the blocks that's, uh, that, that these folks wrote down. In the non-relativistic limit, it becomes um, the block is given by uh, integrating some effective potential that comes from, that depends on the operator. So for example, for a stress tensor, in a D equals three CFT, this V is just like one over R. It's the Coulomb potential. And you get the non-relativistic block by integrating the potential along the world line of a classical trajectory of a particle that moves in this harmonic potential. Uh, and the interesting thing here is that we can compare this to what we get by actually computing a correlator to first order in perturbation theory. And uh, so this is effectively by taking a Witten diagram and taking the non-relativistic limit or just using sort of time-dependent perturbation theory we learn in quantum mechanics 101. And uh, what we find is that the perturbative correlator is not just, of course, integrating over the classical trajectory of a particle. You have an extra integral over the spread of a wave function. Uh, so what this tells you is that a block just gives you a classical piece uh, and there's some quantum piece that has to get come from somewhere. And the interesting thing here is that it's the, precisely the double trace exchanges that have to uh, produce the quantum corrections. So there's this kind of intriguing split where we really have a great interpretation of what the single trace block and the double trace blocks do. Single trace block gives you the classical piece, double trace blocks give you quantum corrections. And this is interesting to understand if this holds to higher orders, and I don't really have any evidence either way to know if that's true. Um, but yeah, this is, I think, Large dimension, people typically expect you don't have to worry about these, but because we're also taking this kinematic limit, you really do need to keep them. Okay. Um, so the last things I'll say are about this Lorentzian inversion formula. Um, this will probably be too fast for the people who don't already know um, about the Lorentzian inversion formula to follow in the interest of time. Um, but, uh, Okay, there's this wonderful formula that encodes the S-channel data um, by doing an integral over Lorentzian kinematics of this, of the correlation function, or in particular, this double discontinuity, which is a double um, commutator. Um, so um, we'll actually talk about not the inversion formula that gives you the data, but rather this generating function that you get by doing the Z-bar integral and leaving the Z-integral undone. And here, operators show up as particular powers in this, in this generating function. And this has a few nice properties. In particular, some things that are, are interesting is that you can't just plug in an S-channel block here and evaluate the inversion formula and get back that S-channel block. It's something that ties together all the data of the theory and relies on nice asymptotic behavior in the Reggie limit and, uh, and, and something that knows more detail about the theory than just inverting block by block. And what we'll see is there's something analogous to that in the non-relativistic limit, which is a surprising new formula to me that I'd be interested in if people have seen something similar or um, can help to understand better. Um, but one useful thing of this inversion formula is that you can use it to compute anomalous dimensions from the CFT. Um, and, uh, and, okay, so this is, um, 
Thanks, Steve. Um, uh, so the basic idea here is that we take this, this inversion formula and you plug in a single block on the right-hand side from the T-channel. You've changed some stress tensor, say, that, that gives you an anomalous dimension from gravitational actions to leading order. And the left-hand side here tells you how the energy of the operator gets shifted by exchange of uh, T-channel uh, state. And this we can compare with the very down-to-earth Time, dependent, uh, time independent perturbation theory that again we learned in our first quantum mechanics class. And uh, so here's a formula that Zara computed in this paper, which is the anomalous dimension you get from stress tensor exchange in any dimension, and it's kind of a complicated formula. The nice thing here is that if you take our non relativistic limit of large dimension, all the dimension dependence drops out except in this combination, which is precisely this reduced mass. And you know, it was a lot of fun in this project. You get these very complicated CFT expressions and you take limits and this reduced mass that you knew from your first undergraduate um, mechanics class pops out over and over again all over the place. It's quite fun. Um, okay, and there are lots of um, calculations like this you can do. Uh, so this, this gives a nice interpretation of various, of a new regime of this, um, of these formulas. So it's a good check. Um, let's do this. Um, okay, so the final thing will be to talk about how we actually evaluate this inversion formula in the non-relativistic limit, a new uh, formula we come up with. So the main idea here is that the inversion formula is some integral of a double discontinuity. Um, but, if you, uh, but if you try to evaluate this, so it's natural to try to uh, do a subtle point approximation to this when you're taking delta, the dimension, to be large. Um, but if you just try to do a subtle point approximation straightforwardly of this piece, it doesn't really work, um, basically because the integrand sort of blows up at the endpoints, and um, and okay, it's not a useful way to evaluate it. But if you go back one step in the derivation, there's a way to rewrite the inversion formula as integrals over contours that go like this. They go along the uh, z bar between zero and one. They go round the branch cut and they come back again. And when you rewrite it in that form. It turns out this subtle point thing does work, but the contour of Stevie's descent does something like this. It comes along, it goes way out to the left-hand side, and then it loops around. I've, for space, I haven't drawn how it, it actually loops around parametrically far away. Um, so you deform through this contour of Stevie's descent, and it turns out that in the non-relativistic limit, the main contribution comes from near the origin. There's, there's an alternative classical limit where you also take the spin to be large, where there's a subtle point that lives somewhere here, and a contour of steepest descent runs around here, um, which is, okay, interesting, and you can ask me about it. But for now, we'll talk about the non-relativistic thing. Um, so really what we have to do is concentrate on what goes on near the origin, small z, z bar, and that was precisely the kinematic regime we were we sort of motivated at the beginning. Um, and okay, you follow your nose, and what you land on is this sort of dispersion relation for non relativistic quantum mechanics. Um, I'll just, maybe I'll, I'll, there's a version that applies to the leading regular trajectory, at the small, so the lowest energy for given spin. This gives you the, those, um, uh, this formula extracts the, um, the energies of that leading regular trajectory. And it's incredibly simple but it involves this contour that runs from minus infinity through round the origin and back to minus infinity again. And thanks, Steve. Um, this formula is, um, okay, I haven't seen anything like this before, but it's got some really interesting properties. First of all, it has nice convergent properties that's guaranteed by, um, by some nice behavior of this correlation function, but it's not behavior that's at all manifest. So it's, uh, and. I'd love to have some physical interpretation of this. It's kind of the analogy of good Reggie behavior that appears in the, in the full inversion formula, but I don't have such a clean um, interpretation of it. Uh, and it's got some of these same properties that we love about the inversion formula. Um, but it's some very novel thing in, as far as I can tell, in, that appears just in non-relativistic quantum mechanics that, um, that I'd love to understand a little bit better. So if, if it's familiar to someone, then I'd love to hear from you. Okay, so let me um, just then finish with a few sort of um, ideas for applications for, for these sorts of things, um, and things we're thinking about. 
now, and I'd uh, again love to solicit input from people here and ideas of, um, of how we might apply these things. Um, so one is, uh, I talked about two-body dynamics, which is very simple, we can sort of solve everything. Um, but if you take something like the Newtonian three-body problem, famous chaotic system, you can look at that in ADS, and we'd again expect that to have some nice um, uh, signatures of chaos and so forth, and that's suggestive that that's going to be dual to some chaos in the triple twist spectrum of CFTs, uh, and I think that's a, a nice regime to try to get a handle on what um, on what triple twist spectrum looks like in uh, in CFTs as a as a sort of guiding example. Um, yeah, another interesting thing is um, uh, is taking our non-relativistic systems and coupling its radiation uh, and um, Maybe I'll just then highlight this one, which is um, there are a few ideas of how you might see this limit in some top-down constructions, n equals four. Um, so the real key question here is uh, is where that where, where these heavy states are going to come from, these operators of large dimensions. So there's a few ideas here, but um, again, I hope to, that someone will will give me ideas of, of where we might uh, look for these things. And with that, I'll. Uh, Thank you for your attention and invite questions. Okay. Thank you, Henry, for a nice talk and questions. Yes, Veronica. Thank you. So you didn't need, I mean, for the symmetries you used pure ideas, but you could have had the same non-relativistic limit for other asymptotic radius geometries, right? Does anything interesting? Um, yeah, let's see. Um, yeah, so the... Um, yeah, well, so the geometries themselves will typically break the... Well, they will inevitably break the conformal symmetry, and so the actual symmetry you're going to be left over with is, um, is the... It's, I mean, it's precisely the usual thing in ADS that if you have your favorite geometry, you can always boost it and move it somewhere else or time translate it. Um, and in fact, yeah, like this two-body problem is an example of that, is that there's a new geometry in the sense that there's a Newtonian potential sourced by individual particles. And the thing the symmetry tells you is that you can go to a center of mass frame. Um, and yeah, I, I think that's the only job it's, it's, it's doing for us. Yeah. Um, okay. uh, actually, you want to just use that? Uh, so, when you take the limit, do you recover the Schrodinger algebra by any chance, or is this completely something different? Which algebra? A Schrodinger algebra. No. Okay. Yeah. So maybe I should have emphasized this. There's um, there's been a lot of work studying the CFT, sorry, the ADS dual of non-relativistic CFTs. Um, that, as far as I know, is completely orthogonal to this, mm -hmm. which is studying the bulk of non-relativistic physics, mm -hmm. which I think has no connection to like a non-relativistic CFT. Like we really we're looking at a sector of a relativistic CFT that that it sits at very high energy and so forth. Um, it'd be definitely interesting if there was a connection, but I think it's um, it's different. And the algebra that appears is this harmonic oscillator, or, or perhaps a Galilean algebra, if you're also taking flat space there. Thanks. When you were discussing the anomalous dimensions of double traces, you showed us about the inversion of a single stress energy tensor. So, mm -hmm. uh, two questions. First, uh, when you apply this inversion, there is an ambiguity at small spin, right? It only goes up to. So, can you compute the low spin data? And the second question is, how far did you go in the expansion of multi-traces? Um, so the expansion of... So you have, here you just have a single stress down energy. Tensor yeah, yeah. Down the rudder. Um, yeah, so the first thing is, how much does this expand, uh, extend in spin? And for example, for the Newtonian potential, say 1 over R potential, it really works all the way down to spin 0. Um, the only place I know that an ambiguity shows up in, at spin zero is that, for example, if you have scalars with a phi to fourth interaction, then 
that in the non-relativistic limit will give you some delta function piece. The delta function piece will only show up in spin zero. Yeah. And that's what, you know, it only comes from double trace exchanges. So it's completely, you don't see it at all from the Lorentzian inversion formula. No, but uh, yeah, I'm asking in the, so after you inverted the stress tensor, you're looking at the double, double traces, right? And this ambiguity that you are saying is precisely in the data of these double traces. Um, I, I'm asking because yes. also in the channel where you have multi, uh, multi stress tensors, it's like gravitational interaction, but you can yeah. have stars versus black holes. And this, these two different objects will enter through this ambiguity. As uh, I understand it, right? Yeah, um, and we didn't say anything at all about like two stress tensor exchanges and so forth, sure. but I think. This is, again, one of the motivating things is I'd love to understand that problem better of having multi-stress tensor exchange. Mm -hmm. And I think this is just us uh, backing off from the problem, doing a simpler context where, where, where hopefully we can make progress. But I don't have anything new to say about it. Other question? Um, do, can you still include the, I guess, large black holes are excluded, but small black holes, is it? Can you still include them or are they automatically? Yeah, so this would absolutely, this would, um, um, our particles, O1, O2, our operators, there's no reason they have to be like fundamental as long as we're keeping the objects separated enough that, you know, the, you know, the separation has got to be much bigger than horizon scale, so you're in the non relativistic limit and so forth. You know, you could do, you could do black hole in spirals that LIGO sees in ADS as long as you're in the post-Newtonian regime where, uh, so that, yeah, there's no reason why a small black hole couldn't be included in this, yeah, absolutely. Sure. Hi, uh, in your non-relativistic Lagrangian, you had a two-particle interaction. It, could, could you remind me what that interaction uh, Yeah, I, so we just looked at central potentials, V of the, the potential that depends on the distance between them. And did you choose a particular form for that? Or? Uh, yeah, so we studied various examples. So, okay, the nicest example we looked at in most detail was uh, Coulomb potential, three-dimensional CFT, four-dimensional bulk, a one over R interaction. And then there's this, I like this plot, so one over R, um, some very universal thing. And this ties, this plot ties together all sorts of different physics that come from this. So on the right-hand side, you've got these linear edgy trajectories that come from free, CFT and there's some perturbations. Down here there's hydrogen atoms or there's Newtonian orbits. And up here there's data that's determined by, uh, um, by the phase shifts that come from Rutherford scattering. And, and these things you can tie together as a complete picture of the spectrum. Um, and in the case where, where you have this in N equals four Yang mills, uh, would you get this from just Newtonian interaction? Um, yeah, so uh, something like N equals four, Again, if you were to just exchange stress sensors, you'd get something like a one over R squared potential. It's in ADS-5 now, um, which you could say something about. Um, but there, okay, in this talk, I, I just had an ADS-5 in N equals four. There's an S5 factor as well. And presumably the real interaction would be a 10 dimensional um, Coulomb interaction. You'd have to include those things as well. Um, so if you were doing top down examples, you'd have to take all those things into account. So what else can you learn about the flat space limit uh, from this whole story? Um, what else have you learned? Yeah, so, um, well, okay, so one thing here in this formula is in the non relativistic limit. Um, we know exactly when this formula is valid. It turns out that at very low energies, this is not quite true because you can tunnel to a bound state potentially. Um, uh, but, yeah, so... So one thing to include here would be, uh, as I said, this is valid for, say, two-particle elastic scattering. Um, we could certainly include inelastic effects, so, uh, so where we allow some conversion to some new particle species, and, and there we could understand how inelastic effects would appear in the spectrum and so forth. So um, there are certainly th games you could play there. But um... More questions? Okay. Maybe I can follow on Steve's question. So uh, do you think we can uh, import, well, there is a lot of progress in understanding in spirals in flat space. 
is it possible to import this in ADS safety and say something about safety? Um, yeah, ambitiously, that was, um, again, some of these projects are sort of my excuse to learn about certain pieces of technology. And one of the things that's interesting is this post-Newtonian expansion that, I, yeah, perhaps it would be uh, interesting to, to understand the, the systematic corrections to this. So I guess I touched on it at the end of saying um, you get qualitatively new interesting effects when you couple your non-relativistic system to radiation, so that's some, some, some relativistic correction to the Hamiltonian, and that precisely gives you effects like the fact that the hydrogen atom excited states are unstable to emitting photons, and uh, or that orbits decay, and I think this is a simple enough system where you could study that spectrum extremely explicitly and, and I imagine you could you could get a lot further in, in this kind of system than you would with a full relativistic problem. More questions? I guess if you had an example with uh, heavy operators um, that would be in this regime, they would presumably be themselves unstable and there would be processes where they would decay to light stuff. Is there some way of connecting the light sector to this sector so that you could talk about the effects of uh, dynamics in this sector but in correlators of light things? I don't think the heavy operators are necessarily unstable. Um, so, uh, and in particular, because you live in ADS, if you're, um, this is one of the things that came out of these resonances, if the lifetime of your object is parametrically large compared to the ADS time, or the width is small compared to omega, then actually there's, there's a very small amount of mixing between your heavy state and the light stuff, but basically a primary operator is mostly the heavy state. Uh, so, um, so one example that I think may be an interesting target for top-down is taking excited string states, so there's going to be masses at the string scale, and sure, these things will decay to, to light string modes, but I think there's a regime where you can make the lifetime parametrically long, so you really have these things stable in ADS. Um, oh, there was a second part to the question? I'm not, okay, thanks. Okay, maybe one last question. Going once, going twice. Okay, let's thank Henry again.